feeders that include stem borers, leaf miners, root feeders, root borers, ones that actually feed on pine tree resin itself. There's also mycophages within the genus, so true mycophagy, where they're actually feeding on the mushroom tissue and getting nutrients from that, as well as ones that feed on rotting mushrooms and actually getting the nutrients from the bacteria that's destroying the mushroom and breaking it down. So there's all sorts of different habitat, you know, habitats that are invaded by the single genus of flower fly. They're also one of the most diverse flower flies in the world. There's over 300 described species of Kylosia. Again, they're mostly in the whole Arctic, so they're very common in both Canada and Northern Europe. But uh, there's a few species that make it down to tropical Asia as well. Uh, there's even an undescribed genus in Australia that may or may not be a junior synonym of Kylosia, I'm not really sure. Uh, so, just as an example of the sort of habitat specification and uh, subdivision these will do. So the marsh thistle is a common native plant in North America. There's at least four different species of Kylosia, or sorry, the, it's invasive in North America, it's native in Europe. Uh, four different species known to feed on marsh thistle, and they've subdivided themselves by microhabitat. So that means that there is a uh, one that's a leaf miner, there's one that's a stem borer, there's a root borer, and there's also one that only feeds on the immature flower buds. So there's at least four species that have all subdivided themselves onto different parts of this plant within the same genus. And they all form a single complex of closely related species. So these probably all speciated within this plant after invading it. Uh, yeah, and Kylosia grossa is one of the species. It's, uh, I think, the stem boring one and they have been introduced in North America from Europe to try and combat this marsh thistle because they're actually somewhat invasive in North America and they can take over with those pretty quickly. Uh, it hasn't actually worked that well to control marsh thistle, by the way. We, we introduced it, it can kind of keep the population down, but it certainly doesn't eradicate it by any means. Uh, so I'm also gonna talk briefly about the economic significance of flower flies. Uh, we know that they're wild pollinators now, this is something that wasn't acknowledged for a long time, but more and more research is showing that these are important pollinators of both in both wild ecosystems as well as agricultural ecosystems. It's actually been estimated that they perform pollination duties for 10% of all agricultural crops worldwide. And so here's just a couple of different photographs that hopefully will illustrate the fact that these really are pollinators as they have large amounts of pollen stuck to them in many cases. So this first one was a Kylosia. Uh, this is Aristalis, and this is also Aristalis. It's absolutely covered in pollen. These things are doing lots of work in terms of uh, ecosystem services with pollination. Uh, there's also several specialist pollinators. Uh, this is an orchid that's found on uh, mainland Asia, uh, Paphiopidillum. Uh, there's two different species, and they're both known to be specialists uh, that are only pollinated by the genus Allograpta. So they're hard to see, but you can kind of see up here, there's the allograpta on the outside of the plant. The plant itself has these dark brown spots on them that are thought to mimic aphids. So the female will come, and you can see labeled E there, that's an egg. So she comes and tries to oviposit next to these aphids. And then in the process, ends up getting stuck inside the plant and pollinating it and doing that sort of, you know, creepy orchid pollination thing where they trick insects into climbing inside them and whatnot. Uh, there's another species of, of uh, Paphiopidillum that does this as well, the anthem. Uh, yeah, it's the same sort of thing. They're probably producing some sort of pheromone that lures the females in and may mimic uh, aphid alarm pheromone or something like that. And the female crawls inside the flower and ends up being an unwitting pollinator in the process. And there's probably more orchids that also are kind of subverting surfeit, uh, you know, overposition seeking strategies, but we only know about these two right now. Uh, there have been some studies on using surfeits for greenhouse pollination. So Aristalis tenax is this sort of cosmopolitan species that was probably originally native to Europe, but it's been spread throughout pretty much the whole world. Uh, they've been used in greenhouse pollination studies and they've been found to be effective pollination uh, or pollinators of uh, sweet peppers. Uh, I think it's just also, ultimately it was found that using bumblebees was a little bit easier. Uh, Aristotle's 10x tends to breed in pretty gross conditions. 
And so no one really wants to breed them en masse because you kind of end up with a giant open septic tank to breed them in. Whereas bumblebees are a little nicer to deal with. Uh, what's more promising overall is their use for uh, biocontrol and secondary pollination. So as I mentioned, a lot of these species are aphid feeders. Uh, you can often attract a lot of these aphids feeding species to monocultures simply by leaving uh, hedgerows at the margins of your fields. So if you don't mow the margin of a field, you'll get lots of them uh, feeding on your crops. And so the larva will help eat the aphids on them and the adults will help pollinate them. So they're providing sort of supplemental pollination and aphid removal at almost no cost. All you have to do is leave you know, a meter or so unmowed at the edge of a field and they'll help out with lots of these and provide ecosystem services. Uh, most of this research has been done with uh, Episurphus baltiatus. This is a European species that's known as the marmalade hoverfly over there. Uh, I think it's because it's orange. I don't know, Brits are weird. Uh, there's also a few pest species. So as I mentioned, uh, there are bulb feeders that cause some damage to bulbs. So there's some that uh, in nursery conditions will destroy small amounts of commercial tulips and daffodils. Uh, you know, general narcissus bulbs, uh, Eumeris narcissi. Uh, this is a European species that was actually described originally in California uh, in the 1920s because it was brought over with plants that were used as ornamentals. And you can see this is a bulb here that's completely infested with uh, Eumeris narcissi. They'll also destroy garlic and onions sometimes too. Uh, they can also be used for waste removal sometimes. So this is Ornidia obesa. This is a neotropical species. It actually used to range quite far north in North America. They again breed in sort of disgusting latrine-like conditions. And uh, when outdoor outhouses were the general method for waste removal in North America, they made it all the way to New York City. But as indoor plumbing became more popular and sort of replaced outhouses, the range shrunk back down to the neotropics because they couldn't live inside the outhouses during the harsh winters in North America. Uh, so these have been used and tested for removal of coffee pulp, sewage, and orange peels. So you can digest several tons of these over a course of a couple weeks just by introducing a whole bunch of Ornidia larva. As far as I know, this hasn't been done on a commercial scale yet, but people are sort of playing with this idea in Costa Rica right now. And uh, on a similar note, Aristyles aeneas this is another species that, like Aristotle's tenax, is introduced in most parts of the world that are warm enough to support it. Uh, and they uh, live, again, in fairly disgusting conditions and have been, they're currently being trialed for economic use of breaking down uh, the waste found in sewage lagoons, uh, as well as the waste lagoons from pig farms and uh, olive farm runoff. Unfortunately, because this is all being tested through uh, you know, privately funded commercial enterprises, uh, none of it's being published right now because none of these companies want to share data with each other. So what I've been told is that they work really well for breaking down sewage, but you can't see the data. So yeah, hopefully one of these days we'll actually find out how good they are at breaking down human waste and maybe they'll be used commercially worldwide for that sort of thing. Until now, apparently we just have to trust the private companies that are funding this. In terms of identifying, uh, your different surfid species. Uh, there is a genus level key that's uh, for North American surfids, but it does work for quite a few genera worldwide. Uh, it's found on the Canadian Journal of Arthropod Identification. Uh, if you Google it, it is open access and it's a picture-based key, so it's fairly easy to use compared to a lot of text-based dichotomous keys. Uh, but again, this is based on North American genera, so it won't work uh, brilliantly in the Philippines. Uh, what there is that came out, we published this fairly recently. Uh, this was in a book series called Biodiversity, Biogeography, and Nature Conservation in Wallacea and New Guinea, Volume 3. Uh, the editor is Dmitry Telnov. Uh, we included a key to genera for the entire region. So this is everywhere from about Thailand to northern Australia, including all of the Philippines. And so there's a key to genera, which should be able to be used to key out all the known genera of surfids in the Philippines. There's also a species checklist, so we don't have keys to all of the, we don't have species level keys to all the genera, but we at least have checklists of the reported species. Uh, and probably the best part about this right now is if you go on ResearchGate and search Dmitry Telmov's name, he did upload a PDF of the entire book to his ResearchGate. 
So it's open access, you don't have to pay for it. You can just download the whole PDF. And uh, actually, if you contact me directly, I do have a PDF of just the circuit chapter if you're interested. And there is actually a small errata about it to it because one of the figure captions was uh, wrong. So yeah, if you contact me, I'd be happy to send that if you're interested in identifying your surfeits. Uh, Philippine surfeits are not that well known, so there's probably lots of new discoveries that could be made. I'm sure there's probably genera that haven't been reported here yet that won't key out properly. But you know, hopefully at least 90% of the genera were recorded. Maybe even all of them, I don't know. But as I said, there's a lot of research that could still be done in this area. Uh, and yeah, so feel free to add me on Twitter or email me if you ever have any questions about surfeits. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk and I welcome any questions.